Hello everyone, welcome back for the Design at Large seminar. And this week we are very lucky to have Ranjitha Kumar as our speaker. Ranjitha is an incoming faculty member at the University of uh, Illinois. And she also has recently started a company, Apropos, where she's the chief scientist. And uh, Ranjitha did her doctoral dissertation work at Stanford, where she racked up a number of awards, including best paper awards at both the CHI and WIST conferences. And notably, um, I think that what you'll see on all of those papers is that they're co-authored with extremely talented undergraduate and master students, one of them. The most exciting parts of Ranjitha's work is that she mentored several undergraduates over her six years at Stanford as a graduate student uh, who went on to do all sorts of cool stuff. I think you have three alums that are at MIT alone right yeah. now. So it's, uh, it's very, very cool. And uh, you'll get to see the work that Ranjita did uh, in conjunction with all of those students. You left out the important detail that I was your student. <laughs> um, so if you want to talk about Scott, I'll be around. Um, <laughs> Uh, so today I'll be talking mostly about the work I did um, for my thesis around this idea of mining design on the web. And a lot of this research was inspired by traditional data mining and knowledge discovery and how they have revolutionized the way that people interact with information on the web. Take search, for example. Um, if I want to find pages related to a particular topic, I can use a search engine like Google that mines the textual content of web pages. Similarly, if I want to find new movies that I'm likely to enjoy, uh, I can use the Netflix recommender system, uh, which mines the ratings people give to the films and TV shows that they watch. But there are some questions that traditional content-based uh, data mining and knowledge discovery techniques can't answer. Uh, in particular, understanding information and understanding how that information is presented are two fundamentally different tasks. So if I want to find inspiration when I'm building a web page or understand if a particular page is designed well, or get suggestions for how to make my page look better, Google isn't going to be much help. And these problems have, been, uh, have all been studied in the literature, uh, and different authors have approached them in different ways, but there's a single underlying question here. Um, if data mining and knowledge discovery have proven so useful in understanding information content on the web, you know, why can't we use the same tools and techniques to study design? Um, answering this question was basically the subject of my thesis. And in particular, I introduced uh, Website Geist, uh, a scalable software platform for design mining the web, bringing data mining and knowledge discovery techniques to web design uh, for the first time. And when you think about it, the web is the largest repository of design knowledge in human history. And it presents an opportunity to learn about design practice on a truly massive scale. You know, every single page provides a concrete example of visual problem solving, human creativity, aesthetics, and there are a billion pages that you can draw from. So, the goal of Website Geist was to give us a way to make sense of all of this design data. So the premise of design mining is to make it easier for users to quickly and easily uh, find relevant information, design information, understand that information by distilling general principles and recognizing design patterns, and then leverage that understanding to power design-driven uh, web applications. So for instance, uh, by automatically retargeting content between different layouts and styles, or making a static page responsive uh, for mobile and tablet display. In this talk, I'll show you how design mining can be used to 
solve uh, all of these problems. Uh, but first, I'm, I'm going to describe the development of uh, the web zeitgeist architecture and the principles uh, that motivated its construction. So web zeitgeist is fundamentally different than content-based web crawlers that statically analyze a page's source. Uh, to mine web design, web zeitgeist renders each page in a canonical view and then stores all of the resources and properties that contribute to the page's visual appearance. Uh, so the important part here is that you have to render the page uh, in order to get at all of these visual properties. And content-based crawlers don't have to do this because they don't usually care about the design. Uh, then we also, uh, to give users a way to interact with page designs, uh, Website Guys computes a visual segmentation of each page um, along with a set of descriptive design features for every element in, the, in these segmentations. So to segment pages in, into design elements, uh, Website Guys leverages the document object model tree or DOM tree. And for many pages, the DOM provides a close approximation to the page's uh, visual hierarchy, but it's not a perfect representation. So many nodes in the DOM don't contribute to the rendered appearance of a page, um, and there can be many different ways to use the DOM to implement any particular visual design. So what we do is we canonicalize the DOM by identifying the elements that contribute to a page's visual appearance, and then reshuffling the hierarchy so that the parent and child relationships in the DOM uh, match the visual containment on the page. Um, and then on top of this segmentation, uh, Website Guys computes a set of descriptive features for every page element, uh, which users and applications can then leverage. So um, these features comprise all the design properties that we could think of to measures, a measure, including um, the render time HTML and CSS properties that is computed by uh, the layout engine, a collection of computer vision features uh, such as uh, just scene descriptors, and a set of high-level structural properties relating to the page segmentation itself. <clears throat> um, the website as architecture is based on four design principles. The first is consistency. We all know that the web is dynamic, um, but machine learning applications expect data to remain unchanged between accesses. So uh, Website Guys stores static snapshots of page designs. The second is completeness. Uh, Website Guys is intended to be a general design mining platform. So if an application needs a particular piece of data, Website Guys should provide it. Um, so Website Guys saves all the resources and properties that contribute to a page's visual design. The third is scalability. Design mining applications need to be performant with millions or even billions of page elements. Um, website guys replicates data in multiple formats for efficient retrieval in a wide variety of use cases. And the last is extensibility. To make it easy to build design mining applications on top of website guys, um, in any programming language or development environment. Uh, users interact with the platform through a RESTful API, uh, which delivers data using JSON. And the Website Guys API is optimized for three common use cases. Direct or random access to specific design properties, streaming access to retrieve large swaths of the repository, for instance, for machine learning applications, and query-based access to allow for filtering based on design properties. 
And this querying interface uh, is exposed via a custom query language we built called uh, DQL for design query language, which transparently converts uh, user re requests into SQL or Mongo query language to abstract away the underlying data store uh, so that developers can ac access design data without having to worry about uh, how or where this data is being uh, stored in the repository. Uh, the website guys crawl was seeded with pages from the Alexa Top 500, the Webby Awards Gallery, and other popular design blogs. And we crawled pages in breadth first order and limited downloads to 10 pages per domain to ensure that we built a diverse re repository. We also spoofed uh, HTTP headers and requested both uh, mobile and tablet versions of pages so that you know eventually we can understand how designs change across form factors. Uh, currently, the website guys data set consists of, of around 100,000 web pages, uh, which corresponds to about 150 million um, individual DOM nodes or about 15 million visual design elements. So now let's turn our attention to the problems that um, design mining can help us solve. One of the things, um, one of the most universal problems faced by designers is finding inspiration. Uh, examples help developers by illustrating the space of possible design solutions and how to implement those possibilities. Uh, but where are designers supposed to turn uh, when they need to find material? Frequently, they rely on hand-curated galleries of pages that have been painstakingly collected over time. For instance, here's an article um, on a popular design blog showing a collection of 40 horizontal web pages. So pages that scroll from uh, left to right instead of up and down. Just out of curiosity, how many people in this room have seen horizontals? horizontally scrolling web pages. OK, so not that many. Um, but you, know, you can see why this sort of uh, curation can be invaluable to designers, um, even though building these galleries is a manual, time-consuming process. Now, with website guys, designers can dynamically curate these design galleries in a matter of seconds. So here's a simple. Um, a query written in DQL, which searches the repository for pages with screenshots that have an aspect ratio greater than 10. So that's pages that are 10 times wider than they are tall. And here's what we get when we execute the query. Now, there are two important takeaways from this example. Uh, the first is that is the ease with which um, design mining can automate tasks that are laborious and tedious for people. And the second is the importance of working with design data at scale. Um, out of 100,000 pages, only 68 or a little less than 0.07% of the archive um, actually match the query. So to, even, to find even a single example of horizontal scrolling, we need at least 1,500 pages in the, in the repository. And the point here is that you really need scale to get at the long tail of design uh, where so much of this creativity is clustered. Another. Um, example of how this kind of curation can be useful is the canvas tag. So the W3C introduced the canvas element in um, HTML5. And the spec describes it as a general purpose scriptable graphics container. And when it was first proposed, uh, there was a lot of confusion over what this really meant. 
So if you search Google to find more information, what you end up with uh, are a lot of tutorials like this one, which give you useful information, but provide little insight into how the tag is actually used in design. So with Website Guys, um, we can find thousands of examples of Canvas elements deployed in real pages uh, and start to develop insight around how the tag is actually used. Uh, so as you can see, they're used for animations, graphs, rounded corners, and interestingly enough, custom fonts. Um, in fact, the overwhelming majority of the, can of the Canvas tags returned by website guys are used to render custom fonts, uh, which is in direct contravention of W3C guidelines. So here, design mining has helped us find an instance where prescribed usage differs drastically from practice. Um, the web font standard is so broken and crippled that designers have found creative ways to uh, create workarounds to guarantee that they can control the way uh, their content is displayed. Uh, another common problem for designers is to be faced with an existing design and want to see uh, similar alternatives. Suppose you're about to kick off your new marketing startup um, and you want to scout out the competition. So maybe you find this website, uh, which is a French company called Milky, and you see that it has a nice website and you want to find other examples of pages with similar designs, um, which you could then use to inform the way you build your brand. And you know this is a task that would be difficult, uh, if not impossible, uh, to perform using Google. But with Website Geist, uh, we can translate some of the high-level design properties of the Milky homepage into a DQL query oh. uh, and search for uh, matching pages in the repository. And <coughs> these results illustrate how similar layouts can be used to express different visual themes. And they might be you know, helpful or useful to uh, you know, help guide the design of your startup's web page. Now, not everyone wants to interact with website guys at the level of code, and people aren't always able to articulate what it is they like about a design or what makes it distinctive. Uh, but with design mining, we can build applications that allow users to search for inspiration in different ways. So we built a search engine that provides the ability to do query by example searches over pages in the website guys repository. And you can try this out on our website, but I'll show you the gist of the interaction in the next few slides. So, so here's the Milky website again, um, right there. But instead of writing a DQL query, uh, we can simply select the page uh, and search for other similar design elements in the database. And this search is powered by a distance metric trained over the, the features, uh, feature descriptors that I described earlier and uses locality sensitive hashing to make nearest neighbor queries in the, in the feature space run in real time. And what's really cool about this interaction is that there are some pages here that like in the DQL query that we saw before you know, have large headers and top nav bars, um, but you'll notice that there are other that are that there are other results um, that are similar to the query in in different ways. So, you know, you'll notice pages that have like dark light, dark striping, um, and so forth. So, you know, once a designer, one other thing you can do here is that once a designer finds a page that she likes, she can actually um, select that page. And then website, uh, the search engine lets you close the loop uh, by uh, actually letting you inspect the HTML code 
and the render time uh, CSS properties that are used by the elements on the pages. Uh, and, and so you can actually use this data to inform the development uh, of your new sites and copy, um, copy properties over. So this is just one example of the kinds of new interactions that design mining can enable. So design mining can also help us understand um, the relationship between the way a particular page element is designed and the semantic role of that element um, in the page's information architecture. So <clears throat> HTML5 was published as a working draft uh, by the W3C in 2008, more than 10 years after the introduction of the HTML4 standard. Um, and one of the most contentious features of the spec was the inclusion for the very first time of a set of purely semantic tags, a few of which you know, are on the slide here um, highlighted in green. Uh, these tags describe the structural role of page content, but have no effect on how that content is actually presented or displayed. And the contention about whether or not these elements should be included in the HTML spec was reflective of this long-standing tension between application developers who want rich structure um, and explicit markup in web design and designers who just want their page to look good. In particular, there's this chicken and egg problem here. Um, these kinds of semantics can enable a whole host of new web applications, you know, making pages more accessible, facilitating retargeting, and improving the performance of machine learning applications. But web designers have little direct incentive to semantify their pages uh, you know, before these applications actually exist. Um, so another thing that design mining can do is help us find a way out of this problem by bootstrapping structural semantic tags um, on pages from design data. Um, we, so we built a crowdsourcing application on top of website guys and used it to collect structural semantic labels for page elements. Uh, we asked participants to select the most important uh, elements on a set of web pages and then to provide descriptors that explain their role uh, in the page's information architecture. So, you know, things like headers and navigation bars. Um, and through this study, we collected 20,000 structural semantic labels uh, for more than 1,000 pages. Where did you take the categories from? Where they choose, right? It looked like a drop down menu. Oh, those were actually an autocomplete list. That was, oh, yeah, that was. So they could write anything they yeah, could. exactly. Um, yeah. So here are a set of spatial um, probability distributions computed from the data that we collected. And each distribution shows where a particular semantic concept is most likely to appear on a web page. Um, and from these distributions, we can see that the visual presentation of page elements and the structural semantics of those elements are sometimes highly correlated. So following this observation, we trained a set of um, off-the-shelf binary SVM classifiers on the full 1,700-dimensional uh, website guys feature space. And from just the design information, uh, you know, without any content analysis at all, uh, we found that we can classify page elements like nav bars and logos with around 90% accuracy. Uh, some concepts, like comments, are obviously harder to identify reliably, 
but it seems like that it seems likely that we can improve these results in the future um, by using more sophisticated machine learning techniques. Uh, the larger point, however, is that we can take these classifiers and run them over new pages. And this allows us to predict structural semantic tags for pages that don't already have them. And once we've predicted this data, we can make it available to developers to drive new applications. Um, for instance, we can make it possible for designers to search for page elements using semantic keywords. So um, one final scenario in which we can leverage design understanding to enable new interactions is automatic retargeting. A common practice on the web is to adapt the designs of other pages um, for new content. So here we have an example of a PhD student who built himself a nice site, and then two professors who stole it. <coughs> so usually the way that one goes about this is by copying bits of content and HTML uh, between pages. Uh, this can be an effective way to explore designs, but as we show here, it's a, also a manual and time-consuming process uh, that operates at the level of source code and requires all of this technical sophistication. So when people transfer content in this way, um, they're implicitly establishing uh, correspondences between page elements, you know, in effect inducing a mapping uh, between pages. So if we could algorithmically reproduce these mappings, uh, we could use them to guide the, uh, the transfer of content and style. So bricolage is an algorithm we built um, that uses design mining data to provide one-click retargeting between web pages. Um, so given two web pages, uh, bricolage automatically transfers the content from one page into the style and layout of another. So at a glance, this seems like a difficult interaction to enable. Um, but the key point here is that this is something that people already do. So we can use design mining techniques to understand how um, and then leverage that understanding to build an automated system. So to develop this understanding, we ran an online study. And uh, we created a crowdsourcing tool for people to specify correspondences between pages. So given a highlighted segment in the left page, um, we asked participants to indicate the corresponding segment on the right. And this process continued until every segment was matched. Um, after every fifth match, users were also prompted to provide a short rationale for why they matched two elements together. So in the data we collected, we actually found several important patterns. Um, first, many participants used words like link, menu, and image um, in their submitted rationales. Uh, you know, indicating that a lot of matching is based on visual or semantic cues. And this pattern is also borne out uh, by the collected mapping. So, you know, people match semantically similar elements together, such as logos, um, navigational bars, um, as well as like, search boxes. However, um, not every element in a web page has strong semantics. And for these elements, we found that people leverage the visual structure of the page to determine where to map them. So one type of st structure is ancestry. Um, we call a mapping 
ancestry uh, preserving if one's two nodes are matched, uh, their children are matched as well. And the mappings collected in our study actually turn out to be 53% ancestry preserving on average. Similarly, another kind of structure is uh, sibling relationships. And we call a mapping sibling preserving if one's two nodes are matched, their siblings are also matched. And supporting these, uh, you know, uh, oh, sorry. And yeah, in our collected mappings, it actually turns out that 84% um, of these matchings are uh, sibling preserving on average. We also find that, you know, if you look at the rationales, we see words like, um, you know, layout, column, and subsection um, that relate to structure. So the study gives intuition about how to produce human-like mappings between pages. We want a matching algorithm that incorporates both semantic and structural constraints. And since the page segmentations we were working with are trees, um, our first strategy was to turn to the, the tree matching literature. Um, so tree matching algorithms define mappings between trees uh, by matching together similar nodes, while simultaneously preserving hierarchical relationships across the trees. But it turns out that the tree matching formalism is just too rigid for mapping between designs. Um, tree matching algorithms rigidly enforce ancestry, and this, this constraint turns out to be too restrictive for capturing um, human mappings. So, for example, um, if we match these two hero images, um, and then we match like the logos together, uh, tree matching breaks because you are unable to match the search bars. So we developed an algorithm uh, for flexible tree matching, which relaxes this rigid ancestry constraint. And we accomplished this by adding sibling and ancestry terms to the tree matching cost model, which makes ancestry and, sib and sibling uh, preservation soft constraints um, and allows the algorithm to balance between them. So just to briefly explain the technical details, um, we formulate flexible tree matching um, as finding the minimum cost mapping in a complete bipartite graph. So the nodes from the two page segmentations uh, form the two sides of the complete bipartite graph. So, and then we define a mapping um, to be a set of edges from this graph such that every node in the two trees is covered by precisely one edge. So let's um, look at the cost of an edge in the graph. Um, the cost is actually the sum of three terms, a visual cost, um, an ancestry cost, and a sibling cost. And we, if we look at the visual cost uh, in particular, it's just a weighted Euclidean distance between the website guy's feature vectors that I, that I showed earlier. So for example, the edge that connects the two H1 headers together will have a much smaller visual cost um, than the edge that connects the header to an image, because those are two very different types of elements. Next, let's look at the ancestry cost term. So let's suppose you fix an edge between um, these two container nodes. Um, then the edge matching together two children, so two nodes that are actually contained within inside those elements, um, these 
this edge will actually have a smaller ancestry cost than the edge matching together one child and an outer sibling node. So the ancestry cost will penalize edges that fail to preserve the ancestry relationships between the page trees. Similarly, uh, the sibling cost term works in pretty much the same way. So suppose you fix, again, an edge between the two, two headers, then the edge matching together uh, two siblings, these two text blocks, will have a smaller sibling cost than the edge matching together one sibling to this outer enclosing parent. Um, so the sibling cost penalizes edges that fail to preserve sibling relationships across uh, the page trees. So unsurprisingly, it turns out that evaluating this cost model and computing the minimum cost mapping is NP complete. And we use a, so we use a stochastic uh, approximation algorithm that works by bounding the edge costs. So what we do is we pick the edge with the lowest cost, lowest estimated cost, and fix it in the mapping. Once we fix that edge, we can remove all the edges incident on its terminal nodes. And by pruning those edges, we can then update the bounds on the remaining edges. So this process repeats. We pick the best edge, we prune, and then we update bounds until we converge to a mapping. So intuitively, you can think of this as first the elements that are semantically very similar on the page get mapped together. So like search bars get mapped together, headers get mapped together. And then the ancestry and sibling costs um, determine how everything that's left over gets matched. And a nice feature of this flexible tree matching is is that we can actually train the parameters of the algorithm on the corpus of collected human mappings. And we do this using the generalized perceptron algorithm, which is a standard uh, structured prediction technique. And in this way, we can learn the cost model that you know, best reproduces human behavior and then use it to predict mappings between any pair of web pages. And in fact, this learning works fairly well. Um, bricolage is able to reproduce human mappings with nearly 80% accuracy. We also uh, learned that this uh, careful balance between semantic and structural constraints is essential to producing good mappings. Because if we remove any of the terms from the cost model, um, you notice that the predictive power of the algorithm decreases. So once we have bricolage, we can use it to rapidly prototype um, alternative designs by taking an, ex an existing page and then retargeting that page's content into new styles and layouts. So um, one of the reasons that retargeting is such an important problem, I think, is because you know, the number of devices on which people view web content uh, is rapidly ex exploding. And manually retargeting pages for every possible form factor is already more or uh, less impossible. So you know, what we need are these automatic methods that adapt content across devices. Um, and design mining gives us some intuition that it may be possible to develop these techniques in a data-driven way. Consider the, the spatial probability distributions that I showed you um, before uh, for popular web elements. Um, but now let's compare how these distributions change between desktop and mobile pages. You know, some elements like headers um, look much, 
much the same on both desktop and mobile pages. They're all at the top. Um, but the distributions for others like sidebars um, change in dramatic ways. So you'll see that the sidebar actually moves to the bottom of the page. So just from this data, it seems reasonable to hope that we might be able to programmatically understand the patterns that designers use when they map content across these different form factors. Uh, and we already, we've already made a little progress in this area uh, by demonstrating how bricolage can be used to retarget uh, between different form factors by training the algorithm on a set of desktop to mobile mappings. So these are still early results, um, but we can, for instance, automatically map this desktop page into two different mobile layouts. Um, and in the future, we hope to apply design mining techniques to this problem with even greater success. So um, as we look to the future, I think it's important to recognize that the vision for design mining is not just to help us build some particular set of applications. Fundamentally, uh, what website guys affords us is the ability to empirically study design at scale. Uh, instead of relying on experts to give us you know, the best practices for web design, uh, we can start to build an understanding uh, from data in a rigorous way. So you see a lot of web pages that look like this on the web. Um, but is this, in fact, what the average page on the web looks like today? Well, we haven't answered this question, but with design mining, we can. Um, and these ideas aren't just restricted to the web. You know, as more and more creative work uh, is done digitally and shared in the cloud, uh, we hope that the lessons we learn and the techniques we develop to answer these questions in web design um, can eventually be transferred to other domains, uh, particularly in the light of all the recent work uh, in computer graphics on data-driven 3D modeling um, and scene understanding. And uh, design mining can help us do more than just build design tools. Um, as we start to ask big questions like, what makes a design beautiful, uh, we can also hope to better understand how design and utility uh, are related. For instance, one question that comes to mind is how Google might use design mining to update um, their rankings of site quality and trustworthiness. Uh, you already see this on the web today, uh, for example, by copying the look and feel of Wikipedia, you could say that Conservapedia um, is increasing its level of trustworthiness. Um, another important ob observation is that while building more sophisticated tools is exciting, um, there's tremendous value to be just had uh, from making design data more readily accessible to designers. Uh, designers, as you can see, are already living, breathing, uh, data-driven generative models. And we know that giving them better access to the information they care about uh, can make them more productive, efficient, and creative. And this is fundamentally uh, what design mining is about, you know, bringing scientific rigor and sophisticated analysis to the study of creativity. Um, eventually, I'd like to be able to understand why turning to 1950s hot rods for inspiration in designing shoes uh, was not only a sensible decision, but you know, a beautiful, powerful, and evocative one. And my hope is that the work I presented here takes a first step um, in this direction. So before I finish, um, there are an awful lot of people I need to thank. Uh, I've been fortunate to work with a group of really talented, passionate, and dedicated collaborators. Um, and none of this 
work uh, you know, would have happened if it hadn't been for them. Maybe some of you recognize a former UCSD alum, Arvind. Uh, so uh, thank you, and I'd be happy to answer questions. said this could improve creativity, but I also see like a risk of it like standardizing web design, like because it's even easier now to steal others' designs and like see what is okay, apparently this is best usability wise and these colors works best on so suddenly maybe every page would look the same, isn't that? Yeah, I boring? mean that's uh, yeah, that's definitely one of the um when you look at the literature around examples and using examples in creative tests, that's definitely um, a thing people have been worried about is being fixated on thing, on the things you look at, right? Um, and the interesting thing, I think, is, is what they've found is that often people end up using examples to kind of fill in the mundane things, um, uh, mundane parts of the tests. Um, and that actually helps increase creativity because um, you're not More blocked. Yeah. yeah, and so like, for example, we've been talking to a lot of designers and there are just like really mundane things that he's just spent a lot of time on, like figuring out what's the matching font um, to this, uh, you know, if, if they're transforming a site into Japanese, what's the matching? sans serif font in Japanese, right? And they can spend hours searching for this kind of stuff. And if we could just remove that, then they could, you know, try out a lot of different alternatives really quickly um, and, you know, increase their creativity. So um, hopefully we can build tools that will kind of uh, help people be more creative by using examples in that way. It goes both ways because if I, let's say I would going to build a dating site. Using your tool, I could actually look at all dating sites if you had actually type uh, if I if I could get all the dating sure. sites, so I could actually see what the dominant colors were on most. So I could like if I wanted to, to go completely other direction, I could use this tool to make something that didn't look like any of the other dating sites. Yeah. Like, so it, yeah, and one of the of things at them, I had to go to every single dating site to like make notes. Okay, they did this, and they but you can actually do it in an instant. And actually, we've been talking to designers, and they already look at examples so they can be different, right? Exactly. So Very knowing cool. the space of what already exists can also help make you be more creative, yeah. A different way of asking Tobias's question is, <laughs> you know, you've, uh, you, you've offered this, this potential future, uh, but uh, there, there may be dangers that we haven't thought about yet. Are you, in fact, a wolf in sheep's clothing? <laughs> <laughs> I know you asked that just to make the, oh, are you, is that, are you asking? <laughs> <laughs> I see you have wolf ears. Yes, uh, that is in fact my costume if it wasn't <laughs> obvious. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think we'll, I think there are two, uh, you know, two use cases that are um, important to take into consideration. There. There are novice users who, you know, can barely make a web page nowadays. So a lot of these tools will actually help them, you know, create a web page. They're not trying to be creative. They're trying to make pages that are, you know, usable um, and follow best practices, right? Um, and then you have designers at the other end of the spectrum who are, um, who are, you know, trying to push the envelope. Uh, and be more creative. And I think these tools can support both use cases. Um, and it depends on how people end up using them, right? Um, so, but it, it would be interesting. I mean, this is one of the reasons uh, we're doing the company is to actually deploy these tools and figure out, um, you know, are we going to run into all of these dangers or not? Oh, sorry. When did you start mining uh, the sites? When? Yeah. Um, so we haven't been crawling for a while just because uh, I had to graduate and stuff. Yeah, so sure. um, we crawled for a month in uh, actually, uh, well, I guess that's not true. We crawled last 
June through September. Okay, because I was just wondering if it was possible to notice like these patterns and the signs. Yeah. I usually, one thing I've noticed is that every smartphone app, their website is this blurry background of a cafe or some <laughs> setting. And then, <laughs> Then the app on the iPhone and then some catchy slogan in the picture. Yes. Big no, I, there. you complete, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. We, we definitely see those kind of trends. And mm -hmm. the thing about um, web design that's kind of exciting is that trends change so quickly. Um, if you look, you know, every year all of these design blogs publish like the newest trends on web design and they're very different from year to year. So even um, having the crawls, uh, crawling pages multiple times, uh, you know, uh, in a, a year could actually show you how things are changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you actually captured that yet? Because I think it sounds like you might have missed the transition to flat UI. It sounds like that might have happened before you crawled. Um, but it would be interesting to have all of the pages from before, all of the pages from a year later. Have yeah. A, have you had a chance to kind of look at the evolution of the web as a whole yet? That's not yet. No, that's so, a very exciting direction, but not yet. Um, yeah, hopefully soon. <laughs> uh, yes. So I was just wondering the structural semantic stuff. You had the, the probability distribution split in mm -hmm. places. Was there a reason you didn't look at the relation between different items within that classification? Because it seems like if you have your logo up here. That's, you yeah, that would be a great, um, I think, way to actually expose that data where people could say, well, I know I want my logo to be centered. Show me what that means about where the navigation bar goes. Um, and I think, you know, we, we haven't done a lot of front end stuff, as you can see, but that would be a really useful way to expose that data. Yes, um, and actually, um, we are thinking of using uh, uh, structural SVMs to actually capture that relationship more because we were doing it independent, um, and you missed that data. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, so I, I was uh, also thinking about Richard's uh, point about the relation of things, and in thinking about the relations of things, that led me to two uh, topics that I'm sure have thought something about one is proportion and the other is visual weight. So, um, you know, if you have a fat banner, how does that affect your navigation and where it would be? Or if you have some visually striking image, how does that affect the way you want to lay out the rest of the stuff? Yeah, I think um, a lot of that's, a lot of those, uh, more uh, visual features we're kind of missing from um, our our descriptors right now, which I would like to capture. Um, I, you know, go reading through graphic design books. Right, that's one of the very important things is um, is contrast. Right, how um, how big is something in relation to something right next to it, and if it's much bigger, then it has a lot more visual weight. And we haven't, um, I think operationalized all of those relationships in our feature um, set right as of now. But that's definitely something we're thinking of moving forward, um, is to capture more of those, um, I guess, d design descriptors. I really liked your answer of the example. And I was wondering, since the problem was more, can you like, mix and match different, say, the uh, sort of fonts of one website with the LA outlet? Yeah, actually, um, we didn't build the front end for the bricolage to do this, but we can actually, once you have the mapping, you could just say, well, I just want to copy the layout over, or I just want to copy the um, the font families over, or the colors over. So it, it is possible, to, once you have the mapping, to separate out those, um, uh, the different, uh, I guess, visual uh, uh, classes. Right, to pr produce like a Franken page, yeah, yeah. So building on David's question, you've done a lot of work with crowdsourcing to be able to harvest stuff that machine learning alone can't find. And, um, do you have thought, I mean, after having spent several years using crowds to augment um, label gathering and other, to 
ask for, for getting at semantics. What are, what's your, looking back, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I, I think we would, we would be better off uh, if we hadn't posed those tasks kind of in the void. Um, I mean, they are hard tasks for people who don't do design. Um, to, you know, we got, um, but the interesting part was that um, we actually got, uh, we used Odesk for some of the collection and Mechanical Turk for another part of the collection. And we actually found that the uh, quality of results were roughly equal, um, even though, um, you know, web designers would have more domain expertise. Um, but I think um, moving forward, what would have been better is if we had, now that we have this collection of um, words that people use, um, I think we can get more reliable results by um, having like a compared, more a compare-based approach of um, like, you know, these two things are possibly the same thing, how would you label them? Um, like if we can take the initial step to actually suggest, uh, you know, not have it, uh, sorry, not have it be so open-ended, I guess, um, to be, have it more constrained. Um. Cool. Ranjita will be around tomorrow and has a few openings if anybody would like to meet with her. Just shoot me an email or come by afterwards. Thanks. Okay, thank you.